action. Hi, I'm Maxime Allard. Um, I'm a PhD student at Imperial College and I'm working on uh, robotic learning uh, with Dr. Antoine Cully. The idea of the work in our lab is basically to um, make the robots learn how to walk or grasp things while being uh, able to adapt if something happens in between. So, uh, for example, if you have a robot that breaks a leg, we try to actually um, learn how to deal with that damage um, so that, for example, if robots are uh, on missions, uh, they can actually come back safely, for example, because a lot of the missions fail if the robot breaks down and you cannot communicate with it anymore. So um, that's more or less the gist of the research uh, we are trying to do in the lab. Of course, there's like little intricacies uh, here and there, but uh, Yes, that's, that's it. Um, Ricci is very interesting for us, I think. It's basically that Ricci is very uh, modular, so it allows us to be very flexible around the things we want to try. Uh, the motors are quite accessible, so we are able to do um, low control, low controllers that we can actually um, work with. Um, there is uh, a lot of resources to do actually simulations. So I can show you that because we work a lot of with simulators because we need data to make robots learn and use uh, things like reinforcement learning or quality diversity. So that's really useful to us. And so Ricci was perfect for that because uh, everything was there already. Um, and even if things break, we can replace them. Um, it's the, the technology is quite accessible um, if you compare it to other robots. Um, so I think these were one of the main um, yeah, reasons why we chose this for our work um, because of just the accessibility of everything and the modularity. No, there's always small things. I think we had to adapt a little bit the, the simulation, the resources, uh, because at, at the point uh, it's called the URDF, which is just a representation simulation, wasn't really correct, so we had to overcome that. Um, but that was quite quick. And then there's like small things like um, an eye fell out <laughs> at some point, so we had to fix that together with, I think, some of uh, Pawn Robotics engineers. But that wasn't really a big challenge. It was just we needed to, to do that. Because it's modular, actually, that was why we were able to fix it again. And also, um, the part of the arm broke when the robot fell, unfortunately. We were able to actually print that or fix it quickly because it's so accessible, uh, which is nice because um, if you would have other robots, you would have actually to probably, you know, call them and get them here or something like that. So um, these were like challenges we had, but like we were able to overcome them from a control perspective. It's actually quite simple, so no big challenges there, I have to say. But yeah, that's mainly, I think, one of the main things. Maybe, I don't know, we haven't really tried it, but I think one of the main challenges that would overcome as well is maybe um, onboard like quick uh, inference for bigger neural nets. So I know we have a TPU uh, from Coral, but it only allows for certain models. Um, and you have to get them into very specific formats, which might not always be available, etc. cetera. So um, we have connect hooked it up to our computers so that we can send commands and calculate on there with GPUs. But I think that's something, you know, if you fit in like, for example, NVIDIA Jetson or something else that can also help a little bit with the inference that might uh, speed things up. But until now, no problem so far, but I, I might come uh, to that. I can't speak for myself, it's hard to speak for the lab, but I think it will go into the same directions. We had another person actually working as well again on, you know, interactions with like objects, so grasping stuff uh, and throwing stuff, uh, which I think we will, you know, it's always nice to have, um, go from re leg robotics, which we are doing a lot, to something that is more around grasping and, and reaching. Our lab focuses mainly on, on, on leg robotics, but the reach is actually you know, a good option to test if the algorithms work in another scenario. And I think we'll always include it because some of our algorithms, we actually want to show that we are general enough. And Ricci is actually a good test bed to, to see if we can actually use algorithms that we can use for like robotics as well on the, on the Ricci for very different tasks. Um, so I think that will be the main goal of Ricci. Um, and maybe even going forward, there's like a lot of improvements going on on the side of with or using robotics with large language models um, and vision-based stuff. And so the Ricci already has the, the cameras on. Uh, and so we are actually trying to maybe play a little bit around with it to re-implement big papers from big companies and, and see what we can do with that and maybe iterate through that. So I, I see it going to that direction uh, in the future. Okay, let's start first. Like with the, the, the current research, I think a lot of progress has been made uh, with techniques like reinforcement learning to actually make um, robots do very uh, general stuff, uh, learn from actually vision, um, and actually adapt to very different terrains when it comes to uh, legged robotics. So that's that's very interesting. And then more and more companies now actually start using as well with the, you know ChatGPT coming into play, large language models, all of that. Um, they actually try to leverage these large language models to um, 
plan for the robot and then make very complex things with these robots. And um, one company is Everyday Robotics has been quite successful, I think, at trying it in their lab or offices to have a robot that actually can manipulate kitchen objects and go to the fridge and everything. And I think the state of the art in, in that sense to combining this planning uh, with like uh, vision-based systems and, and systems like Ricci where you can actually manipulate things and, and reach out to things. Um, and then specifically in our lab, we're actually focusing a lot on, uh, like I said, uh, quality diversity and reinforcement learning. And quality diversity is nothing else than um, finding a lot of uh, very good solutions that all do uh, different things. So instead of having one solution that can do one single thing only, we try to find a lot of solutions that can do things that are quite diverse in terms of behaviors. And this is quite useful uh, for example, I always take the example of damages. So I'm working a lot on damages because if the robot is damaged, you can actually maybe find another way of walking or, or reaching something um, that will allow the... Or if you know that, for example, human can limp on one leg if they are injured, robots cannot really do that. And so if you can make the robot learn how to actually move the arm or the leg, even with a block joint, for example, so you could imagine Ricci has a block joint and it can actually not do that movement anymore. Maybe there's other ways of actually moving the arm to actually um, make it do something interesting. And so we are working on that um, to make that uh, happen. And specifically, I'm working on, um, you know, a hierarchical approach. Let's imagine you have uh, the human um, brain where we can actually do very uh, complex things like manipulate with our hands and stuff. Um, but actually, if you think about it um, at the very low level of our behaviors, it's quite a, uh, it's like a reflex. And then you begin to make it more and more complex by adding uh, vision, uh, audio and everything and you can actually create very difficult movements with our hands and so we are trying to leverage the same techniques where we first make the robot learn how to move the arm for example so uh, we use Ricci on how to move the arms and then we learned okay how can you actually make these arms connect two points together and if you go a little bit more complex you can actually now say okay let's connect these movements to draw digits. So there's a famous data set which is called MNIST, which is about drawing digits uh, in a very simple form. And we actually made Ricci learn um, digits uh, through these hierarchical behaviors and imitate that. And so I can show you later on what we've done there. Um, but the idea is really this hierarchical composition because that will allow you to make more and more complex movements uh, out of this, yeah, out of these primitive movements, let's say, that are easier to learn. <laughs> oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs>I mean, it always depends on, on the person, I guess, on where we are going in five to 10 years. But I think, and also I guess from the research we are doing in our lab and, and why we are doing it, I think we will go more and more to um, these kind of closed loop behaviors that actually uh, get feedback from the environment and do something with it that is a little bit more complex and learned from a lot of data. So I think simulators will actually play a big role in learning more and more um, scenarios uh, because actually um, the simulators become better and better um, the gpus get stronger so you can do much more stuff and actually um, the more realistic the simulator is the more you can train your robot on and i think more and more complex systems will actually start on on, on learning these kind of behaviors um, even in the industrial setting a lot of uh, times you need actually visual feedback uh, for very precise tasks like unscrewing boxes for example you can imagine because right now you might have one robot in the automotive industry that actually unscrews only one task one robot for one task that's, or one screw that's quite expensive and so you could imagine actually with a vision system more and more systems actually start unscrewing a lot of uh, screws uh, but I think we'll, we'll move into that direction. Of course, we'll need to solidify the architecture around, you know, how can we do solid inference on these systems? How can we make them robust? Because that's the other part of this is um, if you learn behaviors, you don't really have control over what happens. Um, and so you might want to have a safety mechanism to actually limit whatever can happen. So there's, I think there's this trade-off, but we are going into a very exciting direction where uh, we can make robots more flexible and, and make them learn things that we cannot really describe, but we can teach them how to do on simulation. Um, so I think that's where we're going. But.